Good morning, Hope College. My name is Emily Scatterday Houlihan, and if we haven't met yet, I'm filling in for our dear friend Lauren Taylor, who just had a baby, as an interim chaplain of discipleship. Um, and this morning I have two announcements. The first is Women's Night Out. Yes. Uh, Women's Night Out is going to be September 23rd. Sign up on the Campus Ministry website. Sign ups go live this afternoon. And after chapel, there will be awesome women handing out these flyers to remind you. Second announcement is that women's Bible study signups ended yesterday, but if you haven't had the chance to sign up, stop by the Keppel House and we'll get you situated. So today at chapel, we're continuing a series that was started at the gathering entitled Good News. And as we walk through the gospel of Matthew together, we'll be looking at instances of good news, people who have experiences with Jesus that announce joy and speak God's grace and love. And today we start in the very first verse of the very first chapter of the very first book in the New Testament, Matthew 1. An account of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. And Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Aram, and Aram the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asaph, and Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh the father of Amos, and Amos the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And here's where it gets a little bit more tricky. And after the deportation of Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Salathiel, and Salathiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abiad, and Abiad the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Achim, and Achim the father of Iliad, and Iliad the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Mathen, and Mathen the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born who is called the Messiah. Whew. <laughs> friends, friends, that is a long genealogy. Why on earth is there a long list of difficult to pronounce names to start the entire New Testament? Why couldn't Matthew have begun with some fun fact or catchy first line like they teach us to do in the fifth grade English class? I mean, if I'm honest, I usually skip the so-and-so was the father of so-and-so was the father so of so-and-so and pick up back when I find that, that the text goes back to normal writing. Anybody with me? And what does this passage have to do with good news anyway? Isn't this just a genealogy, a directory of Jesus' long-lost and long-dead relatives maybe even with a few sketchy characters or family secrets that we probably shouldn't reveal at the beginning of the whole story. But before I explore these questions, let me take a step back and tell you a bit about what I'm bringing to this. My family, my genealogy is complicated and messy, but it wasn't always that way, or at least I didn't think so. For my entire life, until I was 25 years old, I thought I came from a perfect little family. I grew up in a fun and happy home, tucked away in the suburbs with my mom and dad and two little sisters, a dog, a cat, sometimes a rabbit, the occasional hamster or hermit crab. 
until the phone rang that Sunday afternoon. It was September 2nd, 2012. I still remember it. I had gotten engaged only seven days prior, and while twirling that new and shiny ring on my finger that signified love and commitment, I heard my mom tell me that my dad had asked her for a divorce. My world came crashing down, as if I had been comfortably sitting on a chair, and all of a sudden the legs of it split in half. And I wish I could say that my family is whole now, that somehow things changed, but they didn't. I'm a child of divorce at almost 30 years old. But here's where the good news of the genealogy comes in. That list of names gives me hope. Why? Did you see the sort of pauses or parentheses in the text? Did you hear the interruptions to the cadence of, and -and so-and-so was the father of so-and-so was the father of so-and-so? They sound complicated. They sound messy. Maybe this scripture is teaching us something messy. Look with me at these few breaks that give us a glimpse into the good news of Jesus through his own genealogy. It's interesting that these pauses all occur to name women. Genealogies in Matthew's day wouldn't have included the names of women as they weren't really considered that important. So why stop in this lineage of men to name a woman? It's because the least of these the complicated, and the messy are welcomed in the family line of Jesus. The good news, the good news is that the ones who are deemed insignificant and messy by society are deemed significant in Jesus' own family. So in verse 3, we hear, And Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, by Tamar. And then it continues on by Tamar. In Genesis 38, we learn a little bit about her. Tamar is the daughter-in-law to Judah, and she tricks him, pretending to be a prostitute and selling herself to her dead husband's father so that she might become pregnant and have a child. But she only does this because he didn't keep his promise in the first place to give her in marriage to his other son. That is definitely a complicated and messy family situation. And then we arrive to by Rahab, who in Joshua 2 we read is also a prostitute, who ends up risking her own life to help the Israelites take over her own city, which means kill and destroy everything else. Another prostitute in the lineage of Jesus? Messy. And next is sweet Ruth. She has a whole book named after her. Ruth's story begins with hardship. She's not only a foreigner, but she and her Israelite mother-in-law are both hopeless widows. Spoiler alert, her story ends in a happy marriage, but death and loss are a reality throughout the life of Ruth. Messy. The fourth interruption to the genealogy is probably the messiest of all. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. We may know her as Bathsheba, but the author of Matthew wants to make sure we realize what's actually going on here. In 2 Samuel 11, we learn about King David's affair. He's already married and Bathsheba is the wife of a man named Uriah. But King David sees her and must have her. He sleeps with her, most likely against her will, and then sends her husband to the front lines of the battle, and he's killed. That is a whole lot of messy. And then we come to the end of the genealogy where we encounter the familiar story of Jesus' birth. Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. A young, engaged couple, and pregnant. Of course, we know and believe that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. But to an outsider, 
Jesus appears to have been born out of wedlock. Messy. And yet, and yet this is good news. Jesus comes from a family that is messy. In Jesus' genealogy, we find betrayal, prostitution, death, loss, heartbreak, adultery, murder, and scandal. Messiness. But God works through the messy and in the messy and with the messy. God works through our messes, in our messes, and with us as messy people. We've all got junk. We may come from messy families. We may have screwed up big and made a mess out of our own lives. We may feel lonely or overwhelmed or lost or angry. We may feel like a complete mess. But Jesus meets messy people and works with them. And we'll continue to see that throughout the Gospel of Matthew. When Jesus encounters messy people and messy situations, grace, love, and joy abound. This is good news because God in Jesus redeems all of the mess. The good news of the genealogy is that God works through broken people, even messy family situations, to bring salvation to the world. And God redeems our mess. God redeems our brokenness, our complicated lives, our messiness. We are included in the good news. The genealogy tells us that our messes can be included in the salvation story. God works through the messy and in the messy and with the messy to show love, grace, and joy. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Go in peace.